and, and see how all of those factors interact with one another. Now, how do I point? Okay. Let's start here at the break even point. Essentially, if at that point the demand decreases, you will have essentially zero effect on the price. No matter what happens with the demand, as an owner, you're not going to deploy the vessel in the market over the long term unless those breaking the requirement have been met. On the other hand, if a demand at that point of time significantly increases, but provided that there is a number of sufficient ships sitting idle and sufficient ships uh, sitting in the layup, those ships will be gradually deployed, even at marginal rates, which will essentially keep for a reasonable period of time rates in check. Now, this situation is going to change dramatically at the point of time when the world will start running out of ships. And we experienced that in October 2003. Essentially, as a result of underinvestment in uh, a new building, the Cape Fleet uh, utilization became very high and uh, at the same time this was on, on the back, uh, this was confronted with the rapidly growing Chinese economy. The demand increased and what happened? See what happens in this region. In the inelastic region, even a small shift in demand to the right is going to inflict huge change in price. In October 2003, the rates essentially tripled in the space of two to three months. Now, conversely, if we are in this region, when demand shifts to the left, the price will, be, will fall equally rapidly. And that explains the volatility that we have experienced over the last five years or so. Now, obviously, the relationship between the size and elasticity is inverse. Because the number of capes is much smaller than the number of, of handies, the liquidity is smaller, and hence the inelasticity will be even greater. Now why the knowledge of that could prove useful to you? I mean, it turns out that the correlation between the fleet utilization and volatility has been reasonably close. As we discussed just Obviously, in this region, and as an example, we're looking at late 90s, early 2000, nothing really happens. In 2003, once the utilization has gone to the region of 95%, the volatility, volatility kicked in, and we know what happened after that. Okay, so. Now that we know those basics, let's see how we can translate them into a voyage rate that could be relevant to your trade. I just came up with a hypothetical scenario, a shipment of 50,000 tons of wheat from Vancouver, BC to Manila, 7,000 load, 4,500 discharge. I'll show you how you can calculate uh, duration a few slides later, but essentially it works out to about 60 day voyage. It's much longer. These are much different terms than the Panamax terms that uh, Mark was referring to. But anyways, be as it may, it's about 60-day voyage. So how can you calculate the voyage component that covers the OPEX and can give you a hint as to what the uh, theoretical floor for your voyage is? It's very simple. Essentially, you multiply the direct operating cost by 60 days, divided by the number of tons, by the intake, and there you have it, $5.64. Now obviously, when you decide to deploy the vessel on a trade, besides incurring direct operating costs, you're also going to incur voyage-related costs. And these have to be factored in the floor price as well. Now these are port costs, bunker costs, and other costs such as canal dues, extra insurance if the trade involves uh, trading in a war risk area, etc. Okay, you have an example of uh, port, port expenses Vancouver, BC, about $60,000, works out to $1.30. Uh, 
these ports, I mean, these, uh, these are just slides with uh, comparable expenses in Australia and Kalimba River. Note the huge difference between the uh, port cost component between the two ports, especially Canada and the US. And uh, when it becomes essential, I'll discuss in just a sec. Port cost in Manila, about 30,000. Same methodology, works out to about 60 cents per metric ton. Then bunkers, I'll be here until Sunday, so if anyone would like me to explain in detail how it is calculated, I am available at the time and the place of your choosing. But be as it may, at November prices, when the market was in a depressed state, so were the bunkers, it was working out to about $4.67. So there you have it. You total up the voyage component that is required to cover the OPEX, the podcast, bunkers, and there's your theoretical floor. Theoretical is the key word. Now, obviously, the market did not stay in a depressed condition, as, as was the case in October and November. It has improved. Um, whether it's going together again, that remains to be seen. But we move right now to the other chapter, if you will. Say, if you take the prevailing market conditions today, how can you translate the higher rates, the, the, the market higher rates, into your voyage? I mean, first off, you need to identify what are the point of references that owners would use. I mean, essentially, for spot, it comes down to Baltic indexes that are published daily and fixture reports. And for forward shipments, People use either forward curve, Ole is going to discuss that in detail, or period fixtures. Now, you have an example of a daily report. I think this is from uh, May 8. The market was about $12,300. And then you can translate it. Essentially, port costs stay intact. The bunkers are different because, as opposed to 225 in October, November, they were, at the time when I was working out those numbers, at around 360. And the higher cost component right now from $5.64 works out to $14.75. So you know that theoretically the market equivalent of your voyage rate would be around that. Now, things are going to change quite dramatically if we are talking about long-term ranging projects. Uh, this is an example of a, of a long-term pricing for, for wheat. Obviously, I don't know of anyone who is uh, uh, putting together contracts that, that have to do with a 10-year COA for wheat. The nature of trading uh, wheat is such that essentially it does not allow it. But a good example of, uh, of those kind of structures are uh, freight contracts that have to do with power plants because of the risk factors most of the investor would require that the company that, let's say, puts together a new power plant will hatch the cost by a long-term COA. Now, if you're an owner, obviously, you need to price that risk. I mean, would you want to upfront agree to a contract that's going to be a losing proposition and it's not going to cover your capital cost? I don't think so. Obviously, in the short term, as an owner, you can't do anything about the market. And whether you like it or not, you have to incur the capital cost, even if the freight market doesn't cover that. But long term, you want to figure it out. I mean, you want to factor that in, in your calculation. Now, if we take an example of, say, a five-year-old bulker that presently the market price is about $25 million, say, you're putting 75% down and your target IR is 6.5%. Uh, In the end of the day, it's going to work out to about $8,000 per day or $9.60 on, on your voyage. And that needs to be incorporated on top of the direct operating cost. Now, I just want to show you two slides that will underline the difference of 